Hi there, my friend and friends. If you're relatively new to HTML and CSS, or just web development in general, one of the most important things to do is to practice by building out projects. But one of the hardest things to do is first of all finding projects, but then also actually getting started with them because I know what it's like. You open up the design and you're staring at it and you wanna start writing some code and you just have no idea where to start. So today I'm going to be creating this relatively simple layout, which is a challenge from Front End Mentor with the challenge linked down below if you'd like to follow along with me. Now, one thing I'm gonna do a little bit different is instead of simply telling you every step that I would take to go through this to actually make it, I'm going to explain things as much as possible, including my thought process and how I'm trying to like tackle some of the problems with this, because unlike most tutorials, I've never actually made this layout ahead of time. So I'm gonna to need to break things down and think about them a little bit as I go through all of it. So if you do wanna follow along, the what you wanna do is click on the challenge. Again, it is linked down below, and that should bring you to a page that looks like this, where you can download the starter code. I have a premium account, so I can also download a Figma or Sketch file, but I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna go with what you can get on a free account which is the starter code as well as the design files themselves and a little bit of extra information as we'll see. Uh, and then once you've downloaded them, we're gonna open up your editor of choice. I'm using VS Code right here. And what we're gonna do or what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to file and I'm gonna choose open folder. Now, once I do that, I can go and navigate and find the folder that I've downloaded. You will have to unzip it first though because when you download from Front End Mentor, it does give you a zip. And we're gonna do a select folder right there. And then what that does is it gives me this and the handy thing with this, we can zoom in a little bit to make some font sizes bigger, but you can see I can see all of my files here inside of VS Code. For me, it is right here. For you, it's probably on the left side of your editor rather than the right, because uh, that's where the panel usually is here, but I like having it on my right side. So uh, other than that though, there is nothing different. And let's <laughs> jump right in here and you can see we have an HTML file that just has all of the text written out for us basically and nothing else too much. Uh, we also, if we come in, we have a style guide that we're gonna use a little bit of, especially to grab our colors from. Uh, though if you are on Windows, I'll show you another option that you can have. Uh, they only tell us our font size for the sort of base font size that we're gonna be dealing with. So we don't know what our headings are, but it's really not a big deal. And you can see here, they also tell us that it's using the Poppins font family with the two, four and 600 weights. Uh, and we also have our images right there. And we have the desktop design that the larger one there, as well as the mobile design right there. So let's get this started. We can jump back over to our index file here. Uh, and one thing they don't do is provide any other files in all of this. So the first thing I'm going to do, because we're going to need it, is create a style.css file right there. And then we can come back over to here and I wanna link over to that. And what I'm gonna do is because I'm in VS Code, it comes with Emmet installed. So I'm actually gonna write link and then put a colon and just put CSS and hit either tab or return. I will autofill that for me so I don't have to write it out myself. And in doing that, we now are linked to my style.css. Now it didn't know that I was calling it style.css. It doesn't see this file. That's just the default that it calls it. Uh, so I just did that on purpose. So if you have named your CSS file something else, you just come here and change the file name. Or if you need to go into a different path or anything like that, just make sure that you're linking to it uh, the way you need to. And while we're here, I'm also just gonna delete the attribution. Now, I think we're attributing front end mentor enough by using their project and mentioning them throughout this. This, uh, video so I'm going to delete the attribute or the attribution from there uh, I do have prettier installed so it did change the spacing and the formatting on everything for me <laughs> as well it's not gonna be a big deal for uh, as we go through this though it does make it a little bit more of a challenge but I'll, I'll grab the text where I'm not too worried about that what I am going to do though is I'm going to open this design up here in a just in my regular Windows editing software whatever uh, what, I don't even know what they call it anymore uh, I, whatever I just opened it in on my computer uh, and we have this is the layout for the desktop. And then if I go here, this is the layout that we're going to be building for mobile. And in general, I do like looking at both of them before I actually start doing anything because I have to figure out a few things. Uh, and of course with this project, for the most part, one of the reasons I chose it is it's very straightforward. So like maybe, you, you know, you look at this top bit and you can probably do that uh, pretty easily. It's not nothing too complicated there where a text align center does most of what you would need. Uh, each one of these individual cards, there's nothing too fancy going on with those. So you, maybe you can create those pretty easily. You can actually also create three columns. You know how to do that. So for the most part, you know everything you need to do, but there's a couple of tricky things. How are we going to offset these downwards a little bit? Uh, and that's something we're going to definitely be talking about. And you want to plan that ahead of time a little bit because the way you write your HTML will be influenced by how you might be uh, setting things up when you start doing your CSS. So 
when I see this, I'm just hitting the edit button here so I can draw some lines because I like drawing on my layouts when I'm doing them. So here we go. I can just go into the markup. And the reason I want to do that is, is, as I said, here we have sort of this area right here, right, that we have. And the easy thing to see in here is that we have three columns. But when we look at this, there's a few things we need to figure out is like, here's like, let's just say this is number one, we always left to right in general, right? And then we get to this one, which is number two. And then is this one going to be my third one? Or is this one going to be my third one? And start thinking about this stuff before you start writing any code, because you sort of need to decide that when you get to it. And of course, you can make changes, you run into problems, you might have to fix something you did and, and move things around. But the easiest way to sort of know the general flow that things should probably be in is to, of course, look at the mobile design. Because when we look at the mobile design, we can just see it's one, two, three, four, right? They all, mobile design's always the easiest thing. They all stack. So it sort of shows us the order we're gonna be putting this in our HTML. We can change the order if we're using grid or flex. It's not that hard to do, but in general, I like to try avoiding that unless there's no alternative and I, I just have to do it. So without changing the order, that means this one should be my third one, and then this one should be my fourth one because that's how it is at the mobile view. So that does mean that maybe what I could do is just make three columns using Flexbox like this and organize it so the first column only has one item in it, the second column has two items, and then the last one over here has that one last one. Uh, of course, if I do it with Flexbox, then I have to figure out, you know, how am I going to push these down? There's different ways that we could do that. We'll have to think about that a little bit. The other option that we could take is instead of using Flexbox, you could come in and you could use Grid. Grid would definitely be a little bit more complex to set up. So it could be which, which of the two do you feel like you should be practicing? Which one skills do you want to level up on a little bit? Because uh, this is, I think, one of those situations where you could come up with a good justification for either Flexbox or Grid. Uh, but if I did do a grid here, I'd probably need to set things up. So I'd be dividing things this way. And of course, there's a division here as well. And it gets a little bit more complex. So I'm, I, I've decided in my head <laughs> which one I'm going to use. Uh, but ideally, at one point here, if you're following along with this, try and make some of these decisions on your own. I'm going to leave a few of these things uh, a little bit opened. Um, for, you know, because there are different ways to solve these. So think about how you would do this as we're going through the video a little bit. The important thing right now is I know one, two, three, and four. So I'm going to start with that and then we'll sort of come in with the structure maybe a little bit later. But for the moment, I'm going to move this uh, onto the side here just so I can see it and, and keep it in view because I like being able to look at my layout when I write my HTML. So we can come in here and we don't have to do too much, but one thing, you know, this this sort of is my header area, I guess. So I'm gonna try and use some semantic HTML along the way here. Uh, so I am using Emmet. I can just write header and hit tab and it brings that uh, in for me. Uh, one thing we'll notice here is this area is fairly narrow. And if we come and take a look at this screen size, in general, we don't have to worry about it, but we, we definitely, everything does fall within like sort of a, a specific width here. Uh, there's a few different ways that we could handle this type of behavior, but I want to keep it as simple as possible here. So again, if you have a different way that you would approach it than I'm going to here, that's completely fine. But I think what I'm just going to do is have my header up there. Then I'm going to do a dot wrapper. And you might also hear of a wrapper. Uh, people will call these containers as well. I used to call mine container. I've switched to calling it wrapper just because we have something in CSS called container queries now where sometimes you might want to define a container and if you had a utility class or something for it, you would just make sense to call that a container. So I've switched to calling these wrappers. And I'm also going to come in here and I'm going to do a, it's going to be a wrapper and narrow. And this is the BEM naming convention. It's not something I use as much as I used to, but it's super, super common. So I'm going to use it for this video. So I have my wrapper and then I'm going to make the wrapper be a narrower one than usual, just in my CSS with that name on there. And then we can come here and say that I have an H1, a reliable, efficient delivery powered by technology. I personally think that's like one sentence when I look at it. So just because it's two lines, the first line's light and the second line is bold here. Uh, for me, that's reliable, efficient delivery powered by technology. Um, the capitalization on it doesn't really fit with that, but it still feels like one sentence. I'm just going to grab the text from the front end mentor that they provided us. I'm just going to drag the bit that I want uh, up into here. 
And so we have the reliable, efficient delivery powered by technology. And I had word wrap off there and I turned it on. If you want to be able to do that, it is an alt Z and alt Z will turn on and off your word wrap. So uh, reliable, efficient delivery. And then here, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a span and say powered by technology. And this span will set the bold font weight on it. And potentially if we have to, uh, you know, you could also come in here, I guess, with a BR if you feel like you need to have the line break. Um, I don't think we're going to need to bother with that, but if you put one, nothing wrong with that whatsoever. The one thing you do, wouldn't want to do here, and the other reason actually, I just want to sit on this for a second because people make a lot of mistakes when they're doing headings. So I do want to mention that it's important that you don't have, this wouldn't be like an H1 and an H2. Reliable, efficient delivery as an H1, powered by technology as an H2 doesn't really make sense because an H2 should be a section underneath your H1. It's a lot like how chapters work in a book where you have, or think of like a, a textbook, right? Where you have a chapter and then you have subsections under it. The H1 would be your chapter and then the H2 would be one of the sections within that larger heading. Uh, so reliable, efficient delivery, maybe could be the H1 and then the powered by technology bit, I guess could be a paragraph underneath that, but that doesn't really make very much sense to me. So that's just another reason why I'm coming in with an H1 around the entire thing. Just gonna clean that up a little bit. And then we do need to get this entire paragraph right here. So here I can just come in, do a paragraph and bring that in. I just copied and pasted it this time instead of dragging it on over. Um, and there we go. We have the paragraph that follows and that's going to be our bit of text that is right there. And next we want to go down into now this, this area down here, right? Where, where we have our grid. So because we finished off uh, this header here, what I'm going to do is we're going to come down and I'm going to do my main. And I just did type main there and hit tab uh, because as I said, I'm using Emmet. Uh, really fast, if I do that, that would work. Uh, if I just do a dot wrapper and hit tab, that's going to bring a class of wrapper because of the dot. Uh, and maybe you have, say, a section that has, uh, I don't know, a name. <laughs> and then you would get the ID because I used a hashtag there. I'm not going to deep dive how Emmet works in this video, but um, just to slow that down a little bit, just in case it was going a bit fast for anybody. Uh, if you do want to learn more about how Emmet works, I have covered that in a previous video that goes a lot more in depth and shows you a lot of ways you could speed up your working. Uh, so I'll put a link, there should be a card popping up and there'll be a link in the description to that one. But we definitely do want to have a wrapper here and I'm not going to create a narrow wrapper. It's going to sort of be my default wrapper. So I'm just going to leave that one like that and not have any other modifiers or changes that that one would make. Uh, because as I said, this one's gonna be wider, whereas that one on the top, uh, right, we needed that one to be the, the narrow, narrower one right there. Now, there's a few different ways that you could approach this next part. But uh, one thing that's important with it is, so uh, I could add more classes to my wrapper or I could uh, or I could have this be more of my entire layout. So this could be a completely different name or I could come on here and add a second class to here uh, that would just sort of, I guess, be like a uh, you know, grid or whatever we're gonna call it, uh, grid layout or layout or anything. Uh, I just tend not to like having my wrapper do more than one thing. There are times where it could be useful uh, so if you want to go that route, no problem at all. If that's how you think you know, you're envisioning it, it probably wouldn't cause any problems and you'd have a little bit less divs and everything in your HTML and that'd probably be a good thing. Uh, but I tend to like having this do that one thing and do that one thing really well and then worry about the other stuff that's going to be inside. This has the job of holding my content and preventing it from getting too big and then that other content will go in here. It's sort of just sort of my mental model around how I use my wrappers. Now we can come inside of here and <laughs> we need to make that decision. And I said, you know, left this up to you a little bit on which way you would do it. And I'm actually going to explore both options because I want to show them both to you. Um, so, uh, we're, yeah, I, I prefer grid. My, my first instinct for this is definitely to go grid. Uh, but because of that, I sort of want to do the Flexbox option. So we're going to do that. And then I'll quickly show you the grid alternative just so you can sort of make up your mind. But if it wasn't going to be in a video, I would just go grid and not worry about it. But if you chose Flexbox, it's perfectly valid because I'm going to go that route too. Sometimes one is better than the other, but in this case, I think either one would be fine. So in my wrapper, I'm going to call it my layout grid. Um, and we're going to go in there. I come up with names like this, even if I use flex, the word grid doesn't necessarily mean it has to be a grid, right? Uh, and I guess the one downside, actually, if this was only being done with grid, and this is one of the reasons I like it, 
uh, is I could come in and I'm going to call all of these cards. So actually I said I wouldn't do any more Emmet, but I'm going to do card times four uh, and I'm going to put the four cards in there. So it's card star four and then hit tab uh, or return. Uh, and I could, do a, I could do this for my layout and it would work perfectly fine and I wouldn't have any issues. If we want to go the flexbox route, we have to come in uh, and do a little bit more work because here we sort of need this extra area for that. So what it tends to end up being is we end up with column times three, uh, and these don't actually need to have names on them really, but I'll put that there just to make it obvious what it's doing. Um, and then in my first one, I have a card. I'm gonna copy that. My second one ends up with having two cards, and then my third one here, or my, yeah, my third column has the fourth card in it. So uh, it looks something like that. And one of the reasons I think that I prefer using grid for these types of layouts is just so I don't need these extra things to help control my layout. But nothing wrong with it, especially because we're doing a one, two, three, four that way. If it was a one, two, three, four, and this was the last one, it would be a lot trickier to do uh, with Flexbox without playing with order. And even then, I don't. I think it would just become a little bit of a nightmare. Um, so yeah, let's go the Flexbox route and do it this way. And now let's come in the first card here and let's zoom in a little bit on, on what we actually uh, need in here. And actually, I think what we have to do is uh, I'm gonna cancel all my changes on there so I can actually zoom in a little bit and see what the card looks like. And now this is actually an interesting thing because in our card, uh, I wasn't gonna do this, but I'm gonna take a screenshot of this just so we're only looking at my individual card here. Uh, and the reason I wanna do that is because I wanna be able to draw on this and I couldn't zoom in <laughs> on it before. You can take a screenshot, you can draw all over them. Uh, and this is really straightforward, but there is another decision that has to be made here. So we have this layout and this the nice thing with this is we have four cards, but we only have one real decision because we have our card there, which will be an element. Then I'm gonna have this, which is gonna be my H2s. And this is where you might look at it and go like, this would, should be like an H3 or I don't know what, because you're looking at the, you know, this is a big font size and then these are small ones. You should never skip heading levels. You have an H1, then you, the next one has to be an H2. So we're going in with our H2s. So that's gonna be my H2. Uh, this here is gonna be a regular paragraph. I don't even have to do anything. Up here, we could just throw this, the bar there, if you're wondering about it, we'll do that as a border color. And then I get this guy. And this is where the interesting thing comes in because how do we get it to be on the right side over here? And this is, again, one of those little things that we sort of have to decide as we're working on a layout, just like before, where everything here was pretty straightforward, but how do we create that weird layout? Now I have to look at this smaller little layout and figure out how is this guy gonna get all the way over there? And there's different ways that we could do this. So once again, I want you to think about this a little bit, decide how you might try and do it, and I'll give you my solution when we actually start writing the CSS for that bit. Because uh, I think mine, <laughs> I like my solution for this one. Or how's this? I think it's gonna work, because again, I haven't done this, but I've done that type of thing enough times to be pretty confident that it will work. Uh, so there, as I said, we need to have an H2. After my H2, we're gonna have a picture, a picture. I put a P so I said picture, we're gonna have a paragraph. And after the paragraph, we're going to have the image. Uh, in this case, and this is really important because we have alt text, right? All images should have alt text on them. Even if you wanna don't have any, it should be blank. Uh, it should be a blank one and you shouldn't omit it. You have to have the alt attribute on there. In this case though, I actually will leave them blank because I don't feel like the images are actually providing any extra context or information to what's happening here. Some people like using alt text for SEO purposes. It's not really what it's for. If it's decorational, it's decorational, that's it. We wanna treat this as something that is there for accessibility reasons. So if somebody's using a screen reader, they know what it is. Here, they're gonna get supervisor, monitors activity to identify project roadblocks. Magnifying glass? doesn't help, right? You don't want, you don't need to describe this. It's decorational only. It's a little extra visual clue, but it doesn't actually add context or information or anything, right, to, to the user. So in my opinion, these are all gonna be left blank. Now, all of the four cards that we're gonna be creating here have the exact same layout, just with different images and different text. They're all gonna follow this. So I'm gonna speed things up uh, and just skip ahead to once I filled all of that out. And there we go, I have them all in place. So I just brought my text in and I put the links to my, or the paths to my images to link to each one of them. Uh, and now the next thing I'm gonna do is I wanna see what I have in the browser, obviously, that makes my life a lot easier. 
And I have an extension installed that I'm going to put a link to in the description, um, but it's called Live Server. I'm just gonna click the button that it comes with that adds the go live. Uh, another way that you can get this to work is to right click on the thing and just do an open with Live Server once you have installed um, the extension for it. And that would also work. And with that done, here is what we get where everything we need is in place. But now we need to start writing some CSS to actually make it look the way we need it to. So for this part, I'm actually going to just shrink this down a little bit um, just so we can keep the design on screen and keep the final thing on screen. And then of course, keep my code over on this side. So I'm just gonna rearrange my windows and be right back. Awesome, so we're ready to go. And the first thing I usually like to do is bring in all the fonts and colors and all of those different things that I'm going to need. So I'm actually going to jump on over to Google Fonts here because we need to get Poppins. So we're gonna write that in, Poppins. Uh, and there it is, so I can click on it from here. And then you could download the whole family and you could actually self-host this if you want to. If you want to know about self-hosting Google Fonts, I have done a video on that in the past and I'll link to it uh, in a card uh, floating up above my head somewhere. <laughs> um, and in this case, the if we go back to the design system um, that we had here, which was the style guide, I should call it, uh, we needed the 200, 400, and 600. So I'm just gonna come select the 200, the 400, and then the 600 over here. And then they've, they always change the layout. So if you're watching this in the future, this will probably be different, but now they have a little shopping cart icon that I can go to. Uh, and if I scroll down, again, they, they want us to download them now because I think um, self-hosting Google Fonts is becoming much more popular. But for today, I'm just going to hit the copy button that's right here. Um, and then in my HTML, we'll come all the way up to the top and I'm just going to link it right here actually. Uh, just before my file. There is a whole bunch of stuff, as you can see, when we do this, you wanna have it all, part of this is for performance uh, and stuff. So we're gonna include all of the stuff that Google is giving us there. And then we're gonna come and grab my CSS option, uh, font family declaration right there. And we need to have that. So I'm gonna paste it at the top in a comment for now, just so I can easily reference it after. Uh, and the other thing that we need to do is grab the colors. So if we come back uh, to here, we see that we list, they list out a few colors, but we actually have some other ones that are in here. So I mentioned, I'm gonna show you a cool trick to be able to get those, or a tool, I should say. Uh, but I'm still gonna copy these ones over and paste them in just so I can easily reference them. Uh, and then we can get started on this and start putting things together a little bit. So the first thing I'm gonna do is anything like this, I always put in my root as custom properties, just because it makes my life a lot easier. If you haven't used custom properties before, that's completely fine. They're very easy to use and you'll be able to follow along perfectly fine with them, I think, but I will include a link once again to another video uh, that does dive more into it. And the first thing I wanna do is actually take this font family uh, here as a custom property. I'm just gonna call it font family sans. That's how I name it. It's a sans serif font. Um, this project doesn't really need it because we only have a one font, uh, but it just makes it easy to change if ever we need to change it by having it up here. Um, again, you could just call this font family. You could have a different name or because we only have a one font, we only have to declare it in one place. You don't actually need this to be a custom property. But when you start getting into larger projects, I think that it's a good habit to have. So I'm gonna include that there. The font weights we also have. So because we have a two, was it a two, a four and a six, I think which are kind of interesting. So I'm guessing this is the two at the top. This is the six and then I'm, these are six and I'm guessing the most of them are using the 400. So usually uh, if you do a font weight, right? So if I say body font weight, most of the time 400 is like your regular. Most of the time, if you do a bold, it would actually be a 700. Whereas in this case, we want a 600. Uh, and then we're also have that 200, which is like our light one. So what I like to do is name them. So I like doing a font weight and then I'm gonna say light and it's my 200. My font weight normal or regular or whatever you wanna call it is gonna be my 400. And then my font weight bold is going to be my 600. And this is handy because most of the time that's actually a 700, but because this design is a little bit different, you're not having to remember, was it a six, was it a seven? You just always use your font weight bold. Maybe some projects that'd be a 800, doesn't matter because you just have that one name to always remember. So that's how I like to do that for my font weights. I also do the same thing for my font sizes. We're gonna have to just sort of eyeball those, um, right? So font sizes I do on a numbering system. Font size, we're gonna do 400 is always my sort of default. In this case, they did 15 pixels. <laughs> I'm actually going to just say one rem because you generally don't want to have font sizes smaller than that. 
Um, though I guess we wanna match this as closely as possible just because you're a perfectionist. And so if we do wanna go that route, it ends up being a zero point, it's 9375 rem. And always do font sizes in rem, please, not in pixels. I know it's easier. You wanna use pixels in other places, that's fine. Just for accessibility reasons, um, it's always best for your font sizes to always be in rem. And the default there, we are doing a base 16. I know it's a little bit tricky. It takes some getting used to. You open up your calculator, right? 15 divided by 16 gives you this number and you're good to go. Uh, the other ones were eyeballing. So I'm just gonna guess a couple and we can always change them as we go. So my biggest font size is always my 900. My numbering system here is based completely on the idea of font weights, which I call light, normal, and bold, but they have that numbering system where 400 is your normal and then higher up becomes bolder and vice versa. Uh, so this would be my biggest font size. It looks maybe like a 2.5 rem. I'm just guessing uh, we're gonna have a font size 500 because uh, it's going to be a little bit bigger, right? So we have a four, a five will be these guys. Um, so that one's maybe a 1.25 rem. Uh, we're going to throw it together and, and see from there um, how well it matches everything. And I think those are the only ones. Uh, oh, you know what? This one looks bigger than those ones though, right? If we zoom in on that a little bit. Yeah, so this is probably the 15. That actually might be okay for there. And then we're also going to have a, we'll do a font size 600, which can be like a 1.625 rem. Um, these are just numbers that I'm used to using in projects, which is why I'm using them. If you're, again, if you're not used to using rem, you get into the habit, you start knowing sort of the connection between rem and pixel values and you're good to go. Uh, so, and again, we're just sort of going to be eyeballing it along our way here anyway. As for the colors, we're going to do a color, <laughs> very dark blue, grayish blue, and very light gray. The very dark blue is clearly this one. The grayish blue is probably this text here. I'm not sure what the very light gray is. Hmm. Okay, so let's just say, um, I'm going to call it color neutral 900 which is my darkest color and it's going to be a neutral it's i know it's dark blue um but it's probably okay <laughs> and we'll see and there we go that's a pretty neutral um color to me uh so that's perfect our next one is this one so let's just see what that one that's gonna be my color neutral neutral um i'm gonna do that one as an 800 i don't know i'm following that same system the lighter we get uh, the, the, the lower the number. Oh, that's pretty light. Okay. That's gonna be 400. Um, and then what's this one going to be? That's a very light color. If that's our text color, we're going to modify that color neutral 100. Again, we're going to paste. Oh no, this is, yeah, this is going to be almost white. Perfect. Okay. That's probably just the background color then. That's my guess. Um, but of course, so that's these three that they gave us. The pop-ins we're okay with. We can delete that. We need these bars that are at the top and they didn't tell us what those colors were. So I'm using a tool called Windows Power Toys, which I'm gonna link down below. It does all sorts of stuff. If you saw before, it was window snapping things into place. I'm using it for that. If I do a Windows Shift C, I get a color picker and I can get anything on my screen that I want. So I'm just gonna come here and it's hard to get this little bar because it's kind of narrow. I can just zoom in with my mouse wheel and get exactly the piece that I want. And it opens this handy little pop-up right here. So I can grab it in HSL, which is fantastic. <laughs> and so I'm just gonna do color, I'm just gonna call them what they are because I don't wanna try and name these. Uh, I'm gonna grab the eye picker right here, zoom in on the red, you get the picture. I'll go through these next ones. Uh, we'll cut ahead uh, color red uh, while I get the other two. There we go, we have all my colors in place. I tend not to like going teal, red, blue, yellow, uh, but in this case it sort of fits. If you wanted something that's more uh, like meaningful rather than just calling them what they are, uh, you'd see often like a yellow would be warning, um, this would be error, blue would be success, and teal would be, or would, no, sorry, teal would be the success, and then this would, you know, you have different like sort of state names that these colors would fit well into. Um, but we don't really have state here, so it feels kind of weird to be using it that way. So whatever, we're going to keep our <laughs> keep things easy. We don't have any shades or other things to worry about. Larger projects, sometimes having names like this can be a little bit awkward because the color changes and then it's called yellow and you're, you have a blue color all of a sudden and it's weird. But for something simple like this, let's not overthink it. 
Um, and yeah, that sort of has set the stage for us, but we want to have a little bit more in here. So a few things that uh, are handy is first of all, our box sizing. And I don't think we're gonna have any pseudo elements uh, coming in here, but it's very common just to have this with our box sizing border box, especially because I'm using a uh, flex box. I don't think actually we're gonna, this might, it's not as essential as it used to be, but it's one of those things that you might as well do on every project. Um, another thing that you'll often see is star and doing a margin of zero and a padding of zero. In a lot of projects, I actually do use that. I think in this case, I don't need to, so I'm not gonna put it. Another thing that I see is like, we have our SVGs that currently are pretty small, so they're not really getting in the way or anything like that. So I'm not gonna reset my image sizes, but generally I'd have my max width on my images of 100% with a display block just to prevent um, any weirdness from happening, but we really don't need it in this project. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I'm concerned about, not really. <laughs> so let's come in on the HTML. And on this, I'm going to set my font related properties. I used to actually just set all of this on the body because you have to do, because one actually in this case, once again, we don't really need it, but it's just such a, you know, we always do this a margin of zero on the body to get rid of that default margin because we never really want it. Uh, so because I was already doing this, I was always putting my font related properties here as well, but there's more and more CSS units that are coming that rely on root declarations for font stuff that I'm starting to put all of my font related things here. So on here, we're gonna do the font family. And in this case, you know, it's Poppins, how it's my font stack, whatever. We don't have to worry about it. We have custom properties set up. Uh, so I just have to do FF. And because I'm here inside of VS Code, it knows that I want that. So it auto completes it for me. And we have Poppins coming in, fantastic. Uh, the other one we're gonna do is my font weight, which should be my var font weight. And then you can see, I just have those to choose from. Fantastic. And I think normal is the one we want. So probably don't have to declare it, but I often do um, anyway for that one. The other one here we're gonna do is our line height. And I'm gonna do a 1.7 and just see, uh, once we start doing our layout, we're gonna see a little bit, but the line height looks very spaced out on a few of these things. So I'm gonna set it to there. Now, one thing with line heights is it looks good for your body text and small font sizes, but it will not work well on larger font sizes. So these, I'm gonna set a line height to 1.1. Um, especially for this one here, once it breaks onto two lines, that's going to be kind of important to have that set up. We might have to adjust that. I don't know if 1.1 is the right thing, but I'm just sort of setting the stage, going with the flow a little bit. Um, and looking at my design, looking here, I realized I forgot to declare my color. So let's set the color here, which would be my var color neutral 900, I would believe. Um, and this is where I'm actually not sure. And let's, they see how we have the different color. This is definitely darker and that's a lighter one. So this is where you sort of have to decide. I think, I guess here we're gonna do our 400 and it's gonna be so light. I might change, this is probably not passing an accessibility thing. And I'll talk more about that a little bit after, but I'll leave that there. And then we'll just come on all my headings here and say that the color on those is my darker color. Uh, and the reason I'm doing it that way around is I would just assume that if this project were to get bigger and stuff, that the headings would generally be the one that stand out and any new other elements that I come in with would probably, you know, if I had a span that wasn't inside a paragraph, for example, it would probably still be the lighter color um, and other stuff. So I'm sort of assuming that's the base color for the project. And then the headings are the ones that are going to be darker. So we just rely on inheritance. I set the, the main color that's going to be used everywhere here. And then I overwrite it where I need to overwrite it. Awesome. So now there's a couple of little things we're going to do. We have that wrapper that we wanted to create. Uh, I don't know how wide this is at all. Um, we could measure it, I guess. There's probably ways of doing that with some sort of, I don't know if there's rulers in, in stuff, but we're eyeballing this. We just have a JPEG, their fault for only giving us a JPEG, if ever the designer does uh, only give you one. So you just sort of eyeball it the best you can. Uh, one way you can do that is just to make sure your zoom level is at 100%. So it right, right under my head, I'll move out of the way a little bit. Uh, you can see there's a little, it's telling me the zoom is at 100%. So that means if this is at 100% and this is at 100% that they should match each other. So on that wrapper, let's start with a margin inline of auto. And if you haven't seen margin inline before, it's the inline is a logical property, but it's basically saying the left and the right margin only. So it's not affecting the top and the bottom. Uh, it could be if you change writing modes, so you're in a vertical writing mode, things would change, but let's not overthink it. It's our left and our right margin. Uh, and here let's set a uh, max width. And what will the max width be? And this is the part where I'm just gonna guess that it's about 800 pixels. Too big, <laughs> 600. 
Um, and actually, I should be doing the bottom one. This is our narrow one. But let, let, since I'm already here, uh, the points, I think it's probably, wow, they went really narrow here. Eh? Let's do a 550. Uh, that looks pretty close. May not be perfect, but it's good enough for what we're going to be doing. Uh, I'm going to copy this because that one should be for our wrapper narrow. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this in a second, but we'll put that max width there. Uh, and this one, of course, is the much wider one, which is probably closer to 1200. No, it's not that big. 900? 960. A lot of designs go 960. 11. That's not bad. I'm just basing it on this side. It's basically lining up with what I have there. I could get much more accurate and try and make sure, but I'm close enough. When I'm trying to base it on JPEG close enough, is uh, I'm pretty happy with it. So the reason this is working, we see the narrow one working here and then the, the other one working in the other section is just relying on the cascade. This is saying it's a max width of 1100. And then this one is coming after and saying, ah, but if it's a wrapper narrow, I actually want this on it. And we're very much relying on the cascade because if I were to move this up to here and hit save, you can see it breaks the whole thing because now I'm saying it's this. Oh no, but any wrapper should be this one. So just if you do create modifier classes like this, it's very important that they come afterward. And so we'll save that. Um, just quickly to move code up and down, if I hold Alt, I can just push my arrow keys and it moves it up and down within VS Code. <laughs> that's how I did that. All right, so that's not bad. Um, I guess now we can get into the more specific areas. So let's come and we want to look at this part first because why not? We're at the top. So we'll sort of go section by section um, our way through this. And this reliable, efficient delivery powered by technology, my font size is a little bit smaller than I think I need it to be. And I'm actually wondering if that one on the top is a little bit bigger or not. I'm not 100% sure. But what we're going to do, I'm just trying to think. I'm going to grab my entire header. And whenever I'm doing anything, I like relying on the cascade as much as possible. So here is my entire header. So I want to go, okay, I, everything in here needs to be, this is center aligned, this is center aligned. So don't overthink it, don't do it on every one. Uh, even if you're using something like Tailwind, maybe you're following along something like this using Tailwind, uh, don't overthink it, right? Don't <laughs> You don't have to put a center align on this one and a center there. You can just put it on the header itself and it's gonna work. So header text align of center and hit save and everything inside the header becomes text text align centered. Um, then my space here is not terrible actually. I'm gonna leave that alone. It looks like my width is actually basically spot on. So I'm gonna leave that alone. And I guess that just means the problem is it's stuck really close to the top of my page. Whereas here we have a lot of space and we need a bigger gap there. So here I did a margin inline. I mentioned that was my left and my right. I'm gonna come on here and do a margin block and block is your block direction. So it's gonna be your top and your bottom. And I'm gonna do four, probably bigger than that. We'll go in with a six. Maybe it's actually bigger on the top than on the bottom, but I'm gonna go with a six and probably just leave it at that because um, it's close enough. <laughs> Gives me the space on the top and the bottom that I need. Uh, and actually one thing, if you are really new and you're having a little bit of trouble with layouts and visualizing layouts, one thing I would recommend is using things like borders and just saying like a border, two pixel, solid, red, just so you can actually see like, where am I adding? You can see I've added that margin there and then we've added margin underneath. So here, if I came on my main and I did a border of five pixels, solid lime, let's say we can see, okay, I added the margin is pushing away at the top here and it's pushing this extra space down there and I've created this gap over here. So just throw borders on stuff randomly, especially if you're having trouble visualizing stuff because everything is a box, but when it all shares the same background color, it can be really hard to see what you're doing. So there's no harm. Background colors are often uh, really useful or borders or anything just to help you visualize everything that's happening. So now we get to the interesting bit and this is where you have a bit of a decision to make actually. Do I worry about the layout and then make the piece inside of it? Or do I do the piece and then worry about the layout that it's fitting into? 
And if you do things properly, it shouldn't really matter one way or the other. Ideally, things that are set up for layout purposes should control your layout regardless of what's going inside of them and vice versa. If I need three equal columns, I should be able to set that up and plug anything in there. So we're gonna start with the bigger layout and work our way in, but if you styled up the cards and then put them into the layout afterward, there's no problem there whatsoever. So let's come down here and I'm not putting any comments in here, just really fast. If this was a bigger project, I would, but we're gonna end up with not very much CSS. So I'm not, I'm not worrying about comments um, as we go through here. Uh, but let's come in and let's just remind ourselves because I'm old now and I forget how I name things. I called it layout grid. So we're going to come here and call it layout grid or call it. We're going to use that name so we can actually style it up. And I just said we were going to use a display of flex and that should give us three columns. Magical. And there is one thing with flex. Uh, and this is one thing that's a little bit annoying with flex in my opinion. Sorry, I don't want to phrase this in the wrong way. It's not an annoying thing with flex. It's an annoying thing with creating controllable layouts with flex. <laughs> flex is flexible. And so one thing you might notice here is that these are actually different widths, right? Uh, I think it's for me, I see it because here like the line is ending here and then this one is much longer. Uh, but again, let's just come in and say that's our calls, right? So if I say call and do a border three pixels, solid and let's go with a different color uh, we'll do dodger blue because why not um <laughs> there we go quite clearly they're different sizes so what's the solution to this how do we get them to be the same you might have seen several different ones um and again this is one of the reasons i get a little bit annoyed with flex um is because we need to take this extra step if we're doing a layout with it flex is amazing i use it for lots of stuff but uh the the solution is to, gr to grab these calls here <laughs> the call and to do a flex one on them or a width 100% or anything that's going to make them all behave in the same way. Uh, so I'm gonna come here and what I usually do, because I know this is doing my display flex, I just say anything that's a direct child is going to get a, in this case, we'll do the flex one trick, which makes them all the same. Uh, this is just meaning that the flex basis is all set to the same thing, which is actually a zero. And then they have a flex grow of one and they're filling up the space needed doesn't really matter too much why, I guess, but um, we, we can see that that's working. You could just as easily put that on your call. The reason I like doing it with this, so every direct descendant of my layout grid is just because I find it a bit easier for when I'm writing my HTML. I do a layout grid, I throw stuff in there and I know it's gonna be the right size. Whichever way you prefer doing it, if you want that to be your call, that's fine just sort of handcuffs you a little bit in that you have to use the call class when you're using it. But again, that's not a big deal as long as you're following that design pattern. Now we quite clearly need some space uh, in between these. And I'm gonna show you an interesting trick here. This is a beginner video and we're definitely getting into, so far I think it's beginner. This is like maybe slightly beyond beginner. And I'm gonna go into something that's like the next stage. And it's something that I want you to remember. And it's sort of the thing that CSS grew up a lot recently. And one of the things that have enabled that is custom properties. People like doing all their custom properties in the root and then they're just good to go. But sometimes it's good to have custom properties in other places. Uh, it's gonna seem a little bit strange at first, but you're gonna see why I did this. <laughs> and on my layout grid, I'm gonna do my gap here is a custom property. It looks pretty big actually. So I'm gonna say that it's two rem. And then I'm gonna come here and say that my gap is my var gap. And this might seem really silly, but we're gonna do it anyway, <laughs> uh, right? Cause you're going, well, Kevin, completely pointless, right? The reason I'm doing this is because we need to have a space here between these two. How can we do that? Well, if we're using Flexbox the way we're using it right now, I need to be able to say that this has a margin on the bottom probably. So let's go and set that up a little bit. I'm not gonna do all my card styling yet, but I like being able to visualize things like I said. So for now, let's just do padding. Uh, it looks pretty big, so we'll do that same two rem on there. And for now, background of, I don't know, we'll come in with a, a bit of a light color. Uh, so we'll just do an EF, EF, EF. And we'll, we'll actually get them to look a little bit better after. But again, I like just throwing random background colors on things or different things at times, just so I can visualize what's actually happening. And just for video purposes, I am gonna make this a little bit darker. So let's use the color picker here and just do something like that. So yeah, I, I don't want these two cards touching one another. So we will need a way to select this card here and add the margin on the bottom of it. And there are a number of different ways that we could do this. 
Uh, one of the ways that we could actually do it, and it could be useful because we need these to be centered anyway. So what I could do is on these columns, instead of having borders on them, I'm gonna take that off and I'm gonna throw a display of flex on the individual columns. And when I do that, it's kind of weird because now these go next to each other. Oh, that's kind of awkward. And then I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna do, okay, I want the flex and then I'm gonna do a flex direction of column. So by doing that, then it switches things back to exactly how we had them. And this always feels a bit weird. Uh, and actually, I would argue that if this is the step that you're doing, the easier solution is just to do a display grid there if you just want to keep everything stacked anyway. Uh, you can see it's changed things a little bit, but in the end, our solution is going to be the same. So it's really up to you which one uh, you would prefer doing. And actually, because of that, I'm going to leave this as a grid because we just want to create and add this extra space here. And I could select this first card and add a margin to it. And if that's the path that you went, you got it right because it worked. The reason that I like this solution is because I'm going to need to center these vertically anyway. So I need either a flex or a grid on my columns just to make that part of life easier. So to do that, if I need that anyway, I can add a gap here as well. So I can come in with a gap and I could come in and just say gap to rem and it's going to add that space there. But we created this custom property and this is where it's useful because custom properties are inherited by their parents. So if I do that, the nice thing is it's the same gap all the way around. But then if I come on this layout grid and I go, oh, you know what? I got it wrong. I need that to be a one. Well, they all get smaller. The sides get smaller, but this gap here also got smaller. Or I could come here and I could make that a five. And they both get bigger, right? So they're linked together. And this is one of those things that don't overdo it. I could see, <laughs> you see if you, like, that's really cool. And I'm going to start doing that like crazy. Um, or actually maybe overdo it, have fun with it, experiment with it, push it to its limits because you'll start overdoing it for sure and using it in places where it's not really that useful, but that's how you'll learn the limitations and eventually tone it back a little bit. Um, but locally scope custom properties, even if you're relatively new to it, if you like this idea, go all in because they're awesome. <laughs> and if you don't like the idea, again, if you just want to throw a margin on there and match it, that would work too. Or you could even have that margin set to this gap value and that would work as well. There's a lot of different ways to skin a cat when it comes to creating websites. And that's sometimes the frustrating part of creating them is there's no one way to do it. Uh, but it, you know, that's also the fun of it a little bit as well. <laughs> Um, cool. So that's actually done a lot since we're here and I've taken this step, we haven't finished styling everything, but we might as well get these to be centered instead. And all I have to do for that is an align content of center. And I think I got that wrong. Oh no, I got it right. Cool. I wasn't sure. Uh, I was like, is it align items? Is it align content? Would items work there? Items would have also worked. Look at that. So like, even if I got the, the other one, it would have worked. Um, grid is a little bit weird in that we have align content and align items and justify content and justify items. So we have an extra one that's not in Flexbox. They work very similarly though, but it's more based on like where the cells are. But yeah, it, it's just when one works, try the other one is often, is often the easiest way to, to get through things, even with margin and padding, right? If you get confused between the two of them, that's fine. You try one, if it wasn't what you wanted, you try the other one. And if the first one you tried worked, then you're good to go. Um, and eventually over time and just getting it wrong every now and then you start remembering which is which. It's really not the end of the world. And I mean, check that out with that. Our layout is basically done. We just need a bit of extra space on the bottom of our page. Um, so the easiest way to do that, I guess, would be, I'm just trying to think, um, I'm just gonna add some padding lock end and we're gonna do maybe a five rem or something just to give us there we go, a bit of space there at the bottom. Um, I'm doing block end instead of bottom. If you did bottom, perfectly fine. If you did added on your main or something else, a space underneath, that's fine. Uh, whatever, again, there's different ways to approach that. I just, anything that's gonna create that final space here uh, and I'm happy. And now we can get into styling the individual cards. Awesome, this is going along swimmingly and I will address afterward um, how we could approach this with a bit of a grid approach instead of using Flexbox, but this worked really well and it's a nice mix of using Flexbox to create the columns and then using grid within there to sort of get the layout that we want as well, which is kind of interesting. And flex and grid work swimmingly together. So don't be afraid of choosing one or the other. And definitely you sort of do need to learn both. One of them is not the solution. Each is very good at specific tasks. Uh, it's a lot, I always relate it to having different pairs of shoes. You have running shoes and dress shoes. 
they're both shoes, <laughs> just like Flex and Grid are both layout tools. You generally wouldn't want to go play soccer in a pair of dress shoes. You'll probably be sliding all over the place on the turf, or you wouldn't want to really show up in your office wearing some cleats um, for various reasons. <laughs> so, uh, you know, each one does its job. So same thing with Flex and Grid. You do want to learn both of them. Both of them are relatively simple at a standpoint too. They can seem very complex. You'll get like 95% of everything you're going to do with them is the same like simple things over and over and over. And then the weeds are that final 5%. But anyway, before I start rambling on forever, let's do these cards and we're gonna address the different colors that are on them as well and different ways that we can approach that. And actually, why don't you start thinking about how would you style that if you haven't, what would you do to change the color on each one of those? Um, as I come in and do a few other things first. So the background color we don't actually want, but we do need a box shadow on there. Um, it looks like it's actually a little, it's definitely been moved down, right? If Let's zoom back in on this. But see how it doesn't really like stick out the edge as much? Like if it was a larger shadow, it would come around more. We see it on the sides here, but it's definitely been moved down. So this is one thing I always get wrong when I do a box shadow is the values of the offsets. We're gonna do a one, a zero, <laughs> and a one for the blur. And I'm using rem here. If you use pixels, by all means, it's fine. Use pixels. Um, it's it, Pixels for these types of things are completely fine. I'm just so used to using rem for stuff that it's become my default. Uh, the thing I'm wondering about is the color of it. It does seem to have a bit of a bluish tint for now, I'm gonna come in with zeros and then do a forward slash of 0.2, which is my alpha value. Um, see, I moved it the wrong direction. This is just the new color syntax, so it's possible you haven't seen it. It's not that new, but um, most things you'll see will be the comma separated syntax, exactly the same thing. <laughs> so I prefer the new one and the newer color, uh, we have RGB and HSL, but now we also have LCH and OK at Lab and other stuff that use the new version um, and I just prefer it. So. Uh, it's there, but we can see I offset the wrong way. So this one should actually be a zero, and then this one should be a one rem, so it's moving down. Uh, clearly, maybe this should actually be moved down by a 0.5. That's looking a little bit better, but I'm wondering, so this is offset one way, offset the other, my blur, and then I'm gonna come in with a negative 0.5 rem, which is the, I forget the, what do we call that? The spread, right? So it's how far out does it go before it starts blurring? So just if I make this like a five rem, it's gonna go from the edge and go out five rem, and then it's going to have a one rem of blur to, to blur the shadow from that solid color until it gets to, to nothing. So by doing a negative 0.5 here, it's actually sucking it in a little bit. So it sort of follows that pattern a little bit more. Um, you know what, it's not perfect. I actually feel like this is bigger and this is actually bigger and my color that looks a lot better actually um, and then my color I think should be a bit softer red green blue the last value here is blue so I'm just going to try sending it towards the blues and maybe mix in like a 50 on the green I'm not sure if that's the right color, <laughs> um, but it's not too far off. HSL might actually be a bit easier to play with. There's is, no, there's is darker, a 1.5. I don't know. I'd have to play around with it a little bit. That actually looks like it's getting pretty good. I'm pretty happy with that. I do apologize. My dog is also barking in the background. So hopefully you didn't hear that, but the mic might have picked it up. Um, so that's pretty good. Another thing with them is they do have a border radius. So let's bring that in, border radius of maybe 8.5 rem. Um, the border radius can be a little bit tricky to see, but it's not too big. So I'm kind of happy with that. Let's just zoom in a little bit here just for fun. I think that looks okay. So I'm gonna stick with that border radius. And now is the fun part uh, that we said we were gonna get to, which is the colors. How are we handling those colors that are on there? And there's different ways of doing it. So one way is with modifier classes, like we've already seen, that would work perfectly fine. Uh, if this was a larger project, that would probably be the way I would actually go, just because chances are, if you have this somewhere, you're gonna have it somewhere else where you'd have these types of things going. So I'd probably, if this was a bigger project, have something like a border top class even, that would sort of set everything I need. And then after that, I would have my uh, border color or something that would you know, modify the color of what was being set to. Uh, in this case, just because it's a simple project, it's never gonna get any bigger. And just to explore some other options we have with CSS, I'm gonna do a card with an nth child on it. 
and choose the first one. Uh, actually, on all the cards, let's use let's do it properly first. Uh, let's come here, and I'm going to come here actually and set my border. And it looks kind of thick. Let's try three pixels and solid without a color. Uh, of course, we don't want it on every side. We only want it on the top. Cool. And I'm already seeing a problem that I wasn't expecting. So I might have to take another approach. But let's get this to the right size, because maybe if I make, ooh, you know what? If it fills the top. Now this is, hmm. If it goes and it's reaching the edges of the border radius, we don't run into a problem. This is where things get a little bit tricky because I think mine is, ooh, they're close, right? Okay, let's add the colors and then we'll, we'll see. I think that's actually okay. Maybe it's a bit thick. Okay. Or anyway, well, <laughs> I think it's a bit thick, but let's let's come in here with my nth child here. Uh, if you do a border without declaring a color, it will match the color of your text. So, and that's the, the body text color that we have on those. So what I want to do now is nth child one, and we're going to say border color is, uh, that's our teal. So var color teal. And there we go. Oh, see, I ran into a problem. Uh, I was trying to be clever, but of course, and the child, I was thinking I had set it up like I would with grid where I have four children and it would just work. <laughs> uh, but I said, I wanted to do this, the showing you some of the mistakes that people run into. So um, I'm not going to edit this out. So we have that card is there. So what we could actually do is layout grid. So with this, if I did the grid solution, I definitely would have been able to do what I was doing now um, at right. And then I come in with my card and child two, uh, and then I could change that color to what color was the other one, the red, and it would get the red on the top one. In this case, that is not gonna work. And I'm just trying to think easy, if there's like a simple way, but I can't think of a way that would actually fix that. So uh, I'm gonna stick with that. I was a new card and then a border color so we just say, well, let's just say border, I'm just gonna do what I said, border teal. So border color is uh, my var color teal. And then I'm just gonna duplicate that, select this where it says teal, and I'm gonna push command D and it's gonna select the next thing that's exactly the same. And we're gonna make that red. Then we can take this one, command D and make that one yellow. And then select this one, command D that one and make that one blue and hit save. And these become modifier classes. Um, I'm wondering if border is the right one. Like maybe you're changing X. There's other ways we can handle this for sure. I think for this project, I don't want to overthink it and overcomplicate things. So we're going to do that. Uh, so it's a card that has a border of teal and that one goes teal. <laughs> this one has a border of red. This one over here has a border of yellow. And this last one over here has a border blue. That works perfectly fine. Cool. So yeah, that does work. I think what I, my, my line to me looks a little bit thick if I zoom this back into 100%. Um, the two things are, I can't make it smaller unless I make my border radius smaller, right? So the border here is matching the same as my border radius because eight pixels is, is half a rem. So it could be that this could go down and then I could just match this 0.25 rem. Uh, if you're doing this where both numbers are matching, this could be another place for like border. I'm just going to BR for border radius and I'm going to do a three, two, five rem. And then I could just do both of these, uh, right. We can command D just like we did before and var BR. Um, and that actually doesn't look too bad. And you could just come in here again. Let's just make it one rem. You get crazy thick. Uh, and then you make it a 0.1 and it gets super small. Uh, and of course, then if you went with a zero, you would just have none of either one. <laughs> Uh, which maybe isn't great because you might want to have one anyway, but I think that three, two, five, um, actually worked out really well. So we're going to go with that. Um, and it seems to be matching pretty well, I think with the design. Awesome. There are a few things that are off. Um, so that we're going to fix is on my cards. One thing I didn't do, I said I was going to follow the BEM and I didn't quite do it because I just have my H2 in my paragraph. I think what I'm going to do, because I'm noticing the font sizes are off and also we have some, these have margins on them that I don't want. Uh, so I am going to come in 
and I'm just trying to decide, yeah, so we had cards, so very quickly, and another VS Code tip, I'm gonna come on this H2, and then I'm just gonna hold Alt on that one. I'm gonna hold Alt here, and then I'm gonna hold Alt and click here, and put a space, and what this is doing is it's multi-cursor. So I have my cursor in all those places at once, and I can add a class of card, and then do a title. And this is just saying that this title is, the double underscore here means that the title is something that would only be inside of a card. And again, this is just part of how the BIM naming convention works. So there is my card. We have all the borders. We can just come here though and say card title is a font size of my var font size. We have to fix our font size at the top too. So maybe we'll do that next. Uh, 700, let's just see what that's actually gonna look like. Whoops, <laughs> what did I name my, I, uh, I think I had a four, five and a six actually, right? Yeah, that looks a little bit better. The other thing I'm gonna do is a margin of zero. Um, just cause the space between them is coming from the paragraph right now, which is perfectly fine. And you know what, that font size actually looks pretty spot on. So I'm pretty happy with that. That's that one right there. Looking good, awesome. Um, my 500 was this one up here. So I said, we're going to fix our, our other font sizes, right? Cause this one looked bigger than the regular paragraphs. So let's come and do that. And there's no problem, right? I'm getting most of it in the right spot. And then I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot these little details along the way. So, uh, I'm just going to do it this way. Header paragraph, any paragraph that's in my header, I'm going to do it like that direct child but if you did it the other way it's fine if you give it a class that's also fine i said we're going bem and then i sort of didn't go bem here um but let's just say font size is going to be my var font size 500 uh, and of course my h1 which i don't really need to be more specific because you should only have one h1 per page anyway uh, that will have my font size of my var font size did i call it 900 because it was the biggest one i did Cool, and then with that, we also had my H1 span, had the font weight of my var font weight light. I got the span backwards, that's fine. <laughs> the font weight, so this will actually be my uh, bold. And that means my H1 normally has a font weight of my var font weight light. There we go, perfect. That looks pretty good. My line height might have to be a little bit bigger. Maybe the 1.1 I have on there is a little bit tight, so we can bump that a tad. Um, but overall, I think that's actually looking really, really good. I'm super happy with that. Uh, another thing that we will have to address here is if we look um, that I wanted to address is these guys here that I mentioned, and I said I wanted you to figure out a way that you would do that. Uh, I'm gonna do two things, because we do need some extra space on top. They're definitely a little bit lower down. Um, so that's with my cards. Uh, because I did say I'm going with the BEM style, I'm gonna come on all of these and just to show you another trick that you can do, I, instead of multi-placing the cursor how I did it, I'm gonna select my image here and do a Command D because it's gonna select the next image and then Command D for the next one. I'm saying Command. If I say Command, it's Control on a PC. And if I say Control, it means it's Command on a Mac. Uh, and I'm gonna do it one more time and I've selected all of them. But now if I change it, it's gonna take that tag away. So instead of selecting them, I'm just gonna push my arrow key to the side and then I can start going and give them all a class. And my class will be my card IMG for card image. Cool. So now we can come here and we can say that my card image, and we said we want a margin top, so I can add a margin top. Maybe we want two rem or something just to give them that extra space, 1.5, 1.5, something just to give them a little bit more room because I think Maybe the one is actually fine. I was like, it's probably bigger than one, but that actually looks pretty good. Uh, but now I need to get them on the right. So there's a few different ways. I could use a, I could put on the card itself, a display flex, and then on that, we could find a way to align it to the other side. I'm actually doing that with Flexbox is hard to like push one element over, except no, maybe it wouldn't be because we'd have to change the flex direction, but that's all kind of annoying, right? So you go, oh, well, maybe I could use grid instead because then we don't have to change the flex direction. Or you know what, you could just do this. <laughs> Margin left of auto. And it didn't work. Uh, and it didn't work because I didn't do my image reset that I mentioned at the beginning that you normally do. Because uh, for the margin left of auto to work, it will not work on an inline element, which an image is. So let's do this as a mar uh, let's do this as a display of block as well, and then they will move on over. And it also mucked up my my spacing there, so we'll make that a little bit bigger. And there we go. That looks a lot better. 
uh, right? I, I think that's looking much, it's looking exactly like how we want it to, uh, more or less. Um, one thing I think is my overall column width might be a little bit narrow just because I see this card looks a lot wider than my card now that I've sort of set things up a little bit more. Um, but overall, it's getting there. And just to explain a little bit actually how this is working is normally when you use the margin auto, you're doing it for the left and the right, correct? Uh, and that just means it's evenly distributing the space between both sides. But if you do a margin right of auto, it means all the margin goes on the right. You do a margin left of auto, all the margin goes on the left. And then if you put both, it distributes the space between both sides. So a nice way just to easily push something from one side to the other, just make sure that it has a display block and not a display inline because then the margins weren't working properly. Um, which and images are weird because they're also sort of, they're like inline blockish. So that's why the top was still working. Let's not get too much into them because they're funky um, when it comes to that level of things. Um, so yeah, <laughs> that actually uh, brings us getting, we're getting there. I'm just going to boost this up maybe to 1200. Uh, and that looks like it's probably getting a little bit closer to what the actual layout was. Maybe it was even a 1280 because that's like a common, I tried 1300 at one point and I felt like it wasn't right. Um, but now that I've started setting these things up, it's, it's getting closer and closer anyway uh, to what we wanted. This should be at 100%. My font sizes might be off. But anyway, I'm <laughs> oh, I zoomed out here. That would be why. See, that's how you, you zoom in and zoom out on something, and then you, you muck everything up. <laughs> uh, whatever. I'm, I'm pretty happy with how that's looking. Um, maybe my font sizes are a little bit off, but... Uh, a couple of things though that I do want to look at now that we've sort of got everything in place. Um, I'm going to make one change to my wrapper, which is also to add a little bit of padding in line. Again, left and right padding of like two rem. Um, and what that's going to do is it's going to keep it from touching the sides of the screen uh, when we're getting narrower because you could see that it was pushing off. And then of course, when we get to these smaller screen sizes, we don't want this to happen. Uh, at one point, it does have to stack. So that does mean that when we set things up, here, where I set up the layout grid using this, I'd probably want this display flex uh, to change flex direction at a certain breakpoint. That would be the next step, and then we'd basically be done. Instead of doing that, I am going to switch this over to the grid, like I mentioned, and everything is already stacking, because I said I wanted to show both uh, solutions. So one thing with grid, by default, things just stack, and it's using my gap, so everything is working perfectly fine. Um, and then what we could do is, in this case, since we already have created three columns, we could just say that at media, min width, and then choose the size that we want. Uh, I'm just gonna go in with a 800 because it's a nice starting point. <laughs> and we're gonna say that our layout grid has a grid template columns of one FR, one FR, one FR. And that means that at our larger screen sizes, everything is working fine. And if I inspect on this, and then when you're in Chrome, it's this little guy here. If you're using Firefox, it's a similar thing on the other side that opens up responsive mode. And now we can just see when I get to my breakpoint, which probably should be wider, <laughs> but at one point there, everything will then stack one on top of each other and then pulls back out and we get them all working that way. And I think I have grid inspectors on, so it's changing <laughs> the colors of things, but let's, we don't have to worry about that too much. Um, but it's just a nice, simple solution. And one of the reasons I actually like using grid for layouts in a sense is I don't have to worry about changing a flex direction and then changing it back after. I'm just creating a more complex grid as we go through it all. Uh, and on that exact same thing, we could come here and I'm just gonna quickly get rid of my columns. So delete you, delete you, delete those ones. And we have one last div somewhere at the end that we're going to delete. Um, and it sort of breaks my layout a little bit as you'd expect it to, just because we've, we've, we've destroyed everything that we had. Uh, but I, I just want to do this to show you a nice little trick that we can do with grid and why I feel that it's sometimes a little bit nicer is because instead of doing it this way, which would work, I could set this up as four columns. Um, I'm going to do a different one where I'm going to use areas and I don't always like areas, but I feel like for this one, it's actually a nice little um, solution and areas are kind of weird because if we look at the layout that we're building, this is my picture uh, down here at the bottom again. Um, let me just zoom back out on this where we have like these empty spaces here and we definitely need a more complex grid. Uh, but what we can do is you do a dot if you want something to be empty. So dot is empty and then I'm going to have my second one. So that's my two. Uh, and then I'm going to have a dot. 
And then we're gonna come on this next one here. Um, so the next row down is going to be my one, my two, and my three. I uh, know that's my four, isn't it? Yeah, that's my four. Then we're gonna come down on the next row. So the first one is like all here. Then we're doing this overlapping area. Now we're going to this next overlapping area. So it's a one, a three, and a four. And then we're coming down, we have a dot, a three, and a dot again. And the dots are just to sort of demarcate empty space. But the nice thing is you can just come in and put more dots if you want. <laughs> so I like doing it like this because then I just put as many characters as I need. And you can put extra spaces if you want as well. So you're sort of just drawing what you want it to look like. Um, and so I've drawn out my grid template areas. And of course, it's still not 100% working. And that just means here, we don't need this anymore. And my cards, now we actually, we could have had the, the borders that would just follow a little bit easier. Um, but now for my cards, what I could do is that nth child trick. Nth child one is going to use a grid area of one, right? And let's just do, copy that. And we're just gonna set them up for all of them. So that would be my two, my three, and my four. And then I say my two, my three, and my four. And hit save. And look at that, we got our layout back again. Uh, and of course, I'm doing this with card and child. If I didn't even want to worry about what the content going inside there would be, I could even do this would be my, it was my layout grid and select the nth child one, right? So let's just come here and quickly update that. And it's exactly the same solution, but a little bit more robust because I could plug any content in there. But I'm definitely taking things up a little bit of a notch with this. But I just wanted to explore if you used one solution or the other one, uh, that either one is going to work. I think my columns are actually a little bit uneven though. So that does potentially mean here that I'm gonna come and just say that my uh, grid auto columns are one FR, just to make sure that they all end up, any column that's created will be the same size. They're all gonna be that one FR unit um, and they're gonna match each other. And there we go. So I would love to know which solution you actually like better between the Flexbox and the grid one here. Which one feels more natural? Which one do you think you would use if you were to create this or if you've already done this or you were following along, which one you picked? And if you're never really sure about when to pick Flexbox or grid, it is a topic that I've talked about before and you can find more information about that in this video right here. I really do hope that you enjoyed this video and with that I would like to thank my enablers of awesome who are Johnny, Tim, Simon, Andrew, and Web On Demand as well as all my other patrons for the monthly support. And of course, until next time, don't forget to make your corner of the internet just a little bit more awesome.